us, but for those of you who are new, uh, you don't know who he is. He's the past, He's one of the pastors at Berean Mission Church up in the Bay Area, and uh, he's married to his beautiful wife, Carissa, and he has two kids, uh, Miles and Charles, and they're not able to make it uh, uh, for today's service, uh, but he came all the way out here to uh, minister you know, to us, uh, to me. Um, Actually, let me tell you a little bit more about his background, uh, just formal stuff. Uh, he graduated from, I think he went to UCSD, and then he graduated. Oh, woo, yeah, woo, yes. I don't know what mascot you guys have, but it's not cooler than this, okay? Uh, um, I don't know, what's, what's your guys' mascot? A Triton? That's pretty cool. Okay, uh, <laughs> who thought of the anteaters, dude? Uh, but... Um, uh, any case, uh, he graduated from UCSD, and then he graduated from the Master's Seminary. Uh, so he, he, we graduated at the same time in 2008, and that's where we met. And just a, a little bit about us. We went to school and seminary together, and uh, we've just kept in touch uh, ever since then. Uh, I've known Pastor Alton now for 18 years, um, one of my dear friends. Sometimes people wonder who, you know, for pastors, who are their friends? By the grace of God, the Lord has given me uh, um, a peers at, at Cross Life. You know, people have known me from college, but I'm also blessed to have friends I have made in seminary, friends uh, with whom I keep in touch uh, over the years. And um, one of the things I'm really grateful for is that um, men like Pastor Alton are people who understand uh, some of the struggles that we have to go through as pastors. And um, he's somebody I can talk with, and he understands um, the hardships, whether it's personally with the family or with the work of the ministry. And uh, he's somebody who has been there for me, always encouraged me. Um, he balances me out. Sometimes I get a little, I nerd out on things. And then he reminds me of the importance of just that devotion and affection for Christ. And I'm so blessed to have a friend like him uh, speak into my life and to be there for me. And even with the, with the preaching opportunity here today, um, he makes himself available. He's from the Bay Area, but he tries to make himself available to preach for us. And um, I feel bad because I never do that for you guys. But anyways, <laughs> he tries to make himself available uh, uh, for me and for obviously to serve the church. But um, I know he does it because he wants to bless me, uh, being in the pulpit, constantly giving and preaching. I don't have much opportunities to be on the other side and just to rest and to, to be fed. And so it, it really is a treat for me uh, to hear God's word and to hear it from a good friend and brother. So let's welcome Pastor Alton up as he delivers God. Well, good afternoon, Cross Life. Uh, it is uh, a joy and blessing to be here. Uh, it's always good to be with this church body, uh, to be amongst friends. Uh, we think so highly of this church, and I have much love for your pastors. And uh, as James mentioned, I I've been friends with your pastor James for almost 20 years. It's uh, really hard to believe. I'm so thankful for his ministry, uh, not only just to this church and here in Southern California, but as well uh, just uh, to me and just uh, in my life. And um, I'm privileged to be able to be invited uh, by Pastor James and uh, Pastor Matt for the opportunity to preach God's word to you. Uh, this afternoon, um, James encouraged me to preach something that's more from the heart because he's been preaching stuff that's been more heady uh, in his words. And that, that is totally uh, like an accurate description of our relationship. Oftentimes, I'll be like, hey, James, like, what's something you recommend that I should read? What, what have you been reading? And he'll be like, uh, I've been reading like the divine discourse of religious epistemology from the church fathers, you know? And then I'm like, he's like, well, what have you been reading? I'm, uh, how to love Jesus more. Uh, so it's just, uh, that's totally just been uh, the, the sort of dynamic of our relationship. But don't get it twisted. This brother uh, has one of the biggest hearts I know uh, for the Lord and for this church family, and so I'm always encouraged to hear how well he speaks of this church and how well you guys are caring for the pastors and the leaders here. And so uh, this afternoon, uh, I want to have you turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 28. Uh, the Lord really laid this on my heart to, to share with you this afternoon, and so I trust that it'll be an encouragement to you. And as we turn there uh, to Matthew 28, uh, let us stand in honor and reverence for the reading of God's Word. This afternoon, we'll be looking at Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. 
And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is God's holy word. Let's pray. Father, we just commit our time to you now, and we ask that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts ready and eager to receive your word that we might be changed into the likeness of Jesus Christ, your son, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In 2002, a Christian book took the world by storm. This book simultaneously hit number one on the four major bestsellers list, the New York Times, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, and Publishers Weekly. It has sold more than 60 million copies worldwide, unheard of in the publishing world. It has been translated in over 50 different languages, making it second uh, most translated in the history of books, second only to the Bible. This book has been regarded as one of the most influential books to both believers and non-believers in our generation. What is this book? Well, some of you may have guessed the title of the book is The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. Now, this isn't meant to be an endorsement for the book, but it highlights this important point that so many people are seeking purpose. In fact, the full title of the book is The Purpose Driven Life, What on Earth Am I Here For? And that question is an important one for everyone, but especially for us as Christians, as those who have come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And yet you think about this, as a believer, we've been saved and forgiven of our sin and have the promise of eternal life with God through faith in Christ. But the question is, having been redeemed, why are we still here? What is the reason for my life? What is my purpose? And more broadly, the, the general answer that's often given by Christians is we're here to worship God and to glorify Him. And that's a good biblical answer. But the question in response is, if that's true, why can't we worship God and glorify Him in heaven? How come that after we came to faith in Christ, God doesn't just take us to be with Him so that we can worship Him and to glorify God there? And in fact, to do it perfectly as the Bible tells us that we will do in heaven. If we can worship and glorify God in heaven just as we can on earth, the fact that God has left us on earth tells us there has to be something more. And so what is it? What is the answer that should direct our lives as God intends? Well, the answer that's given to us is found in our text. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord doesn't take us to be with him in heaven because he's given us a mission on earth. It is the greatest mission that we've been commissioned to do. It is to make disciples of all nations. As those who are followers of Christ, this is the great work that has been given to us to do until the Lord takes us from this life. It is to go and to reach unbelievers in our homes and in our schools, in our workplaces, in our communities, in the nations for the sake of Christ. This is our calling upon this earth to the glory of God. And many of you know this. But if I were to ask you, if you were to evaluate your life, does it show that the Great Commission is your purpose? Or does it show that something else is? Where are you in this area of evangelism? Do you regularly evangelize and make disciples? Who have you shared the gospel with within this past year? Who are you praying for that they might be saved? Are you missional in your everyday life where you even look for opportunities to share Christ with those that God brings into your life. If we're honest with ourselves, this area of our faith is the one we struggle with most. 
But my hope is that as we look to the words of Christ this afternoon, that it'll help to renew our commitment to the Great Commission as a priority, where you and this church will grow in greater faithfulness to make Jesus known. And so this afternoon, we're going to look at Matthew 28. We're going to learn three truths about the Great Commission. First, if you're taking notes, we see here a clear commission. Verse 18 says this, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What we have here in Matthew 28 is known as the Great Commission. And while this is certainly the most familiar passage The same command is actually given to us five different times in the New Testament, four times in the Gospels and once in the book of Acts. Mark chapter 16, Jesus once again commands us to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Luke 24, our Lord says that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. In John chapter 20, Christ says that the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And in the book of Acts, The resurrected Christ, he speaks to the disciples gathered around him before he ascends to heaven. And his last words to them are, you will be my witnesses. I think what stands out within these verses is the clarity of this command. Notice these statements aren't tucked away in a corner somewhere. It's not in some obscure place that we have to really try hard to to look for. This command is given to us comprehensively within the first five books of the New Testament. It is clear as day, and it's meant to underscore its priority in our lives. In effect, these are Jesus' marching orders to the church. This is our command. This is our mission. This is our purpose. And while it's not the only thing we do, the Great Commission is the main thing that we do as believers and as a church. Just as every believer's first calling is the Great Commandment to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, every believer's first assignment is the Great Commission. The last command of Jesus must be the church's first priority. And so it means that though all of us have different gifts and abilities and roles and desires that God has given to us, we are bound together for a common cause. It is to make the name of Jesus known, and it is to proclaim the gospel in every nation of the earth. The priority of the Great Commission is clear, and yet despite its clarity, there is a disconnect with our obedience. Statistics tell us that 95% of all Christians have never won a soul for Christ. 80% of all Christians do not consistently witness for Jesus. Less than 2% are involved in the ministry of evangelism. 71% do not give towards the financing of the Great Commission. In many ways, the Great Commission has become the great omission in the church. It's just not happening. And usually the lack of evangelism in our lives, it comes with it a long list of excuses. It's not my job. It's the pastor's job. I'm I'm too busy. I don't have the gift of evangelism. I don't know enough. I I don't know how. I don't want to offend or make people angry. I don't want it to be awkward. It's not going to work anyway. There is a list of excuses that we have for not going. And Jesus comes before our excuses today and says, by the authority given to me over heaven and earth, you are to go. Evangelize the lost. Preach the gospel. Make disciples. Notice Jesus makes no qualification about going. He says, if you've come to believe in the gospel and you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, no matter for how long or how short, no matter how old or how young, no matter how much you know or how little you know, no matter whether you're gifted or not, as the one having all authority, you are to go and evangelize and to make disciples. And failure to do so is disobedience to Jesus Christ. 
We are all obligated to go, to proclaim the good news to friends and family, and coworkers and classmates, neighbors and strangers, and to the nations. So the command to evangelize is clear. But notice the, the application is intentionally not clear. See, we know what Jesus says here, but, but I want you to notice what he doesn't say here. He doesn't say, go to Jamboree and Baranca and preach there. Go to Spectrum Center and evangelize there. He doesn't say, go and knock on every neighbor's door and share the gospel. He doesn't say, go and become a full-time missionary. See, there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to evangelism. There is no one model for how we share Christ. There is no, you have to do it this way instead of that way. Instead, there's a gracious freedom with the Great Commission. It can be sharing the gospel with someone on your flight. It can be having coffee or, or boba and, and sharing with someone about Jesus. It's inviting your classmate or neighbor to have lunch and building gospel relationships. It's going out and spending intentional time with unbelievers and looking for opportunities to talk about the things of God. It's using a teaching moment with your kids to point them to Christ. It's reading through a Tim Keller book with someone who's seeking. It's taking someone to church for them to hear the word of God and then following up with them. There can be so many different ways for us to live missionally. And let me say this. Obeying the Great Commission doesn't mean that we have to give a full gospel presentation every time that we talk to an unbeliever. We, we want to share the gospel, no doubt. And that needs to be the eventual goal. But it also depends on the readiness of someone and the situation. Sometimes a gradual approach is best. Uh, let, me, let me speak to this for a little bit. I've read so much on evangelism, and this is something that I'm passionate about. I love telling people about Jesus. And at the same time, I'm still learning. But over the years in my experiences, this is something that I've recognized, that diverse audiences in their openness to the gospel necessitates diverse approaches. The problem in the church is there are often effective evangelism methods for those who already believe in God, who are churched, who are open to consider the claims of Christ and those who are closer to coming to faith. But what about for those who are skeptical, indifferent, hostile, antagonistic to the gospel? Is there something for them? The, the co-worker who mocks Christianity, the family member who is a blasphemer, the friend who wants nothing to do with Christ or even to talk about religion at all. And that's where this idea of pre-evangelism comes in, in bridging this gap. For those who are unfamiliar with this term or concept, there was a theologian, Francis Schaeffer, who first coined this term. But what pre-evangelism is, is defined as the bridge-building process of tearing down objections and obstacles to a sincere hearing of the gospel message. So if evangelism is planting the seeds of the gospel, then pre-evangelism is preparing the soil. The seeds of the gospel can't be planted and take root until we tend to the soil of people's minds and hearts. And again, we're engaged in this process of paving the way so that an unbeliever is ready to hear the good news, to receive it, and Lord willing to believe. Here's how I like to illustrate it. Uh, imagine there's a line from A to Z, okay? And if you will, this is the spectrum of unbelief somewhere on this A to Z scale. And so Z is someone who's really close to faith. They've heard the gospel. It makes sense. They're ready. All someone needs to do is, hey, would you like to be a Christian? And then they're in. And on this side is A. Now, A is the most hardened, angry, militant, atheist you can imagine. And every non-believer that we're talking to is somewhere within the spectrum. 
And I know it's, it's overly simplistic, but allow it for this purpose. A lot of evangelism strategy was formed in our country in the 50s and 60s. And we've learned to ask questions like, if you were to die tonight, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? And if God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? And those are great diagnostic questions. Those are great questions in general. But they're more effective for those who are on this side of the spectrum, maybe a, a, a you. Because if you think about those questions, it assumes common ground. That there's a God and there's a heaven and that God is personal and that our actions have eternal significance. and All that is presupposed. But if you meet someone who doesn't share that worldview or beliefs, those questions are irrelevant. If you meet someone who's a letter D, that, that's not going to be effective. What we understand is that Jesus had different starting points and did different things with different people with where they were at. And we need to do the same. Patiently and graciously and, and wisely, we need to find out a person's starting point and help him or her move towards the truth. And in this gradual process, we need to remember that we ourselves, we didn't come to faith overnight. And we need to trust God with this process and to trust him to do what only he can do, and that is to change hearts. I think to set small goals where we just want to lead someone from D to E and pray that God will bring others along to bring them from E to F and by God's grace can even bring these individuals all the way from F to Z and faith in Christ. It's a process for most people. And I think the, the, the all or nothing approach to evangelism can be paralyzing for some of us. And it's why probably we come up with excuses because there's too much emphasis on a decision. Sometimes we just need to put a pebble in someone's shoe. You, you want to just do enough to give a person something worth thinking about. We want them to hobble away on a nugget of truth that he or she just can't simply ignore or shake off because it continues to prod at them. We're praying for the first step of a response simply to be a sleepless night where a person has a hard time shaking a certain truth or question and then coming back to you to talk about it. And then the hope is that in this pre-evangelistic process and this approach, it leads to evangelism. And a definition that we've used of evangelism and that I found to be really helpful is from Evangelism by Max Stiles. And I, this is what he says, evangelism is simply just to teach the gospel with the aim to persuade. You're just teaching the gospel with the aim to simply persuade. That's all we're doing. Too often we confuse the results of evangelism with evangelism itself. But the call to evangelism, understand this, it isn't to elicit a positive response or to get a decision or to have that person accept Christ, but rather it's simply to proclaim the good news of salvation in Christ. It is to share with them about who Jesus is and what he has done for sinners and to call them to faith. And then we leave the results to God. And if they don't believe, we haven't failed. And I tell our church this all the time. We don't fail in evangelism if we faithfully present the gospel and that person doesn't come to faith. We only fail if we don't faithfully present the gospel at all. See, there are times when we try to evangelize and we fumble over our words. We're not making sense. We're a nervous wreck. It doesn't come out right. And we're like, man, that was so bad. And I've been there so many times. But God is sovereign. And I want to tell you that he can use our most feeble attempts and he can use the weakest of gospel presentations. But what God can't use is silence. Let me tell you a story. During my senior year of high school, uh, I was a really young believer at the time. But I remember despite my spiritual immaturity, for as long as I can remember, I've always loved to tell people about Jesus. And I really took to heart the Great Commission. And I had a friend who was in college, and 
she began dating an unbeliever, and, and she had met him at work. And my other friend and I really cared for the sister. And so we sat her down, and we talked to her, and we told her that this wasn't wise, that she shouldn't be dating an unbeliever, and that she shouldn't be compromising her faith. And so understand, we're, we're young, we're being overly zealous for truth, we're being even like legalistic about this, and we told her that she needed to break up with him. And so she was heartbroken, but she realized that we were right. And so she leaves the meeting seemingly convicted to do the right thing. Well, the next day she tells us, so I, I didn't break up with him, but I invited him to church. Okay, so she's like, I did the next best thing, right? And so she talked to him about God. By God's grace, this guy started coming out to church regularly. And we tried to welcome him and love him and pray for him. And eventually, I, I asked to, to meet up with him over lunch to evangelize to him. And I have to emphasize that he was pretty much out of college at this point. And here I am, this high school kid. And so you can imagine you being a young professional, and you're being talked to by this little 17-year-old about the issues of life, okay? But I didn't let that stop me. And I shared with him about Jesus, and I remember going through the Romans road with him, and it was rough. I probably accidentally spoke some heretical things during our talk, but at the end, I shared the gospel, and I said, I simply asked, Eric, are you ready to accept Christ? And inexplicably, he said yes. He told me years later that he was softened to the gospel at that point. See, there was pre-evangelism happening. And it prepared his heart to hear the gospel that afternoon. God was already doing a work beyond what I could see. And through the most broken gospel presentation at a little booth of a Denny's restaurant in Sacramento, my friend gave his life to Christ. He married our friend. They have four kids who love Jesus. They're walking with the Lord. He's serving as an elder of a local church in Elk Grove. This is just evidence of God's grace. And it's just one story of many of how the Lord uses even weak and imperfect and sometimes disobedient vessels for his good work. And I hope and pray that encourages you. We are commanded to simply be faithful, to share our faith, because the commission is clear. Secondly, we also see a compelling commission. See, the Lord, he, he doesn't have us act on guilt and conviction when it comes to the Great Commission. No, what he does to compel us is he shows us his heart. The heart of God compels us, and we see this in verse 19, "'Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations.'" One part of this great commission that we often overlook is when Jesus says, all nations. That's significant. It has always been God's desire to reach the world of lost people and bring them into relationship with himself. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, it says, This is a good and pleasing thing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then probably the most well-known verse of Scripture, it states this truth, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We have to understand that God has a love for the nations. And it's seen throughout Scripture. Why is this? Because simply put, all people are lost and dying and going to hell because of their sin apart from Christ. And so God wants for all to be saved. And he says in 2 Timothy, in 2 Peter chapter 3, the Lord is not slow about his promises as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This is the heart of God. He has compassion for sinners in this world. The Lord wants none to perish, but for all to come to repentance, he says. And so what he does is rather then saving us and then taking us immediately to heaven, he sends us out with this great responsibility to go to the nations so that we might win more lost and dying souls to Jesus Christ so that all might be saved. 
I'm reminded of an account that happened in 1905. During that year, there was a ship built named the Titanic. I don't know if you've heard of it, but there might have been a small budget movie made about it, but it's pretty well documented what happened. Many know about the significance of the sinking of what was thought to be the unsinkable ship. But many forget it was a tragedy of epic proportions. 1,500 lives were lost. 1,500. And what many don't know is that on that fateful night, the Titanic received six messages about the iceberg that they were approaching, but it was ignored. And the last message was given 40 minutes before the Titanic's collision with the iceberg. The radio operator of the Californian attempted to warn the Titanic that there was ice ahead, but he was cut off by an exhausted Jack Phillips who was manning the telegraph that evening. And Phillips inexplicably fired back an angry response with these words, Shut up, shut up, I'm busy. And when he finally went to bed that night, Phillips would shut off the radio of the Titanic, receiving no further messages. And consequently, the Titanic would hit the iceberg, where 1,500 people would pass from this life into the next. This is the situation of all people and of our world. Whether they want to acknowledge it or not, or tell us to shut up, people are heading towards destruction and hell because of their sin. And the Lord is sending us to proclaim the gospel and call for them to repent and to turn around. We are called to warn people that there is danger before them. But the good news is that Jesus has come into this world to rescue us from what is certain destruction. How? By taking that destruction for you and me. Our Lord says, I will go on that sinking ship and I will die in your place, even though you deserve to. But I choose to love you instead. And Jesus would be raised to life to show that he has overcome sin and death. And if you are an unbeliever, the Lord is calling you to repent and to turn around and the trust in Christ for forgiveness and salvation. Because apart from Him and His grace, there is no hope. No amount of good deeds and wishful thinking can save you. Deliverance is found in no one else but Christ. This is the message of Christianity. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for us as believers, it's the news that we have to share with those perishing in the world. That they might turn to Jesus for salvation. That's our mission. We need to share the same heart that Jesus had, to have the same compassion that God has for the lost, to be so burdened and broken for sinners who are perishing that it would drive us to do whatever we can do to reach them, that we would say with Spurgeon these words, that this would be the prayer of our hearts, that if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. We need such urgency. And like you, there are times and seasons in my life where my soul no longer weeps for the loss. And I lose compassion for the lost. I no longer pray and cry for the salvation of sinners. And my evangelism at times is non-existent. There are times I look at my life and I realize that I've been making Christianity only about myself and my church and my ministry. And in those moments, we need to look to the heart of God once again to compel us to go and to reach our unsaved family and friends and to preach to them about the love of Jesus. So we see a compelling commission. Third and lastly, we see a comforting commission. 
Verse 20, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Here is a great encouragement that we have as we go forth into the world and to make disciples of all nations. It's this, that Jesus is with us in this endeavor of the Great Commission. Jesus is with us. And why it's an encouragement is because if you look at yourself and your evangelistic abilities and you see that maybe you're not articulate, you're, you're not extroverted, you're not bold or courageous, you're not as knowledgeable as you want to be, it seems that you're not adequate for the task at hand. And sometimes it's scary, right, in going. It's a fear that paralyzes us. And I know a lot of us, we get nervous a lot of times when we share, but here the Lord promises us that he will make us adequate, that he will empower us with his spirit, and he will use us mightily when we simply just go. What Christ assures us of, uh, uh, of us is this, is that while we can't in of ourselves uh, do this, that he can. And he does so through those who are just faithful. He can use you to change lives, to win souls for Christ, and to make disciples of all nations, not because of us, but because he is with us, our Lord says. And you look at the lives of the apostles and how they became bold witnesses for Christ and how they, they took the world by storm with the good news of Jesus and they changed the world as we know it forever. But if you think for a moment that they had special abilities, you're mistaken. You look at their life and it was marked by failure and by weaknesses and disappointment. They were just ordinary men who had come to know the extraordinary power of God who works in and through them. And Jesus simply called these men to share in the great work that he was doing. And as they were willing to go, they wouldn't go alone. God would use them as his vessels in his hand to spread the gospel from the ends of the earth. He gave and he fulfilled this promise in the life of these men. And I want to tell you that this same promise that Jesus gave to his disciples and that he fulfilled in their lives he gives to us, and he sees to it to fulfill his promise in our lives as well when we go in the same way. And his promise is meant to assure us that it would lift this burden from you, that whether someone accepts or rejects Christ, it doesn't rest on you. The Lord says it will rest on me, not in what you do, but in what I can do, not in your power, but in mine. See, God is the only one who can change hearts. And when Jesus commissions us, he isn't simply saying that it's our responsibility to save people. That's God's responsibility. Jesus simply tells us that our responsibility is to preach. In our role in preaching the gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 3, all that we're doing when we're evangelizing and sharing the good news is that we are either planting or watering hearts of men and women but it's God who causes the growth eventually. See, we're just vessels, but in the end, it's, it's all God. God does the work that we cannot do, where he opens the eyes of the hearts of people to see the beauty of Jesus, where he convicts them of sin and he moves within their lives to bring them to faith in him. And the thing is, God, he might not... He might not allow you to see this, but God at times might be gracious to allow you to see the fruit of your planting seeds and watering where someone you evangelize to, they, they eventually come to faith in Christ. But again, it may be that you might not, not ever see a person that you evangelize to come to faith, but it doesn't mean that you failed. And it doesn't mean that we should be discouraged or disappointed when we don't see results initially. Because God can still be at work even when we don't see it. And I hope that this gives us hope. Uh, my wife uh, told me the other day, um, she says that, uh, I don't think that you're good at evangelism, but at least you try, okay? And so I, I don't, you know, she says, but that's good because that makes you more relatable, okay? Because you're not that good. And so it was like the most backhanded compliment ever, okay? My wife has no chill, um, but it's true though. Hey, thanks, bro. It's, it's hot here, man. Um, <laughs> It's true, I, it's, I, I'm not gifted, um, but I try to be faithful, and in so doing, 
I've seen the words of Jesus that I will be with you come to life in so many evangelistic encounters. Whether it's been on college campuses, at the mall, to Uber drivers and passengers on a train or plane, to neighbors and those at the gym or a coffee shop or local restaurants or the family and friends. God has opened so many doors and it's a matter of just having eyes to see and to be obedient. And I truly believe that God, he uses weak and perfect vessels just as we are to do his great work. You think about this, God could have done anything to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He could have written in the sky. He could have brought lightning and thunder. He could have moved mountains. Instead, he chooses to use broken vessels like me and you. You might not think that you're good enough or articulate enough or winsome enough, but that's exactly the place that God wants us to be. Because in our weakness, we get grace and God gets all the glory. Let me end with this. I want to share my testimony because it's a part of the reason that I have such strong convictions about missional living. See, I grew up in a non-Christian home. I didn't know anything about God or who Christ was or about the gospel. But when I was in middle school, our family had moved to a new part of town in Sacramento. And I remember these neighbors in this new neighborhood went out of their way to introduce themselves to us, to help unload our moving truck, and to serve strangers that they had just met. And it was so foreign to me to to see such kindness. I didn't know what we did to deserve this. I had never seen this before, of people so selfless and thoughtful and genuine in their care. And I remember over the course of time, walking home and seeing the smiling faces and, and waving hands of this couple across the street, during Christmas time, they, they brought over cookies that the wife had baked. It wasn't very good, but I, I didn't understand again, what, we had di- what we had done to, to receive this love from them. Over time, my neighbor began to intentionally build a relationship with me. He took time to talk with me, to play ball with me, to show me the love of Christ. He was the only Christian I knew. And one day, He invited me to a barbecue that happened to be on a Sunday morning at 10 a.m. I was tricked. It was a barbecue, okay? It was a church service. I unknowingly went to church that Sunday. And I would never be the same. A few weeks later, I gave my life to Christ. And when I look back, it wasn't a single individual, but it was a community working together for the cause of the gospel. There were different people praying for me and meeting with me, befriending me, teaching me, and loving me. And through it all, God was softening my heart to faith. In April of last year, my home church closed its doors. I had the privilege of leaving after church at Berean and making the drive to Sac and being part of the last service. We got to sing songs of praise to hear testimonies, to give thanks to God for his goodness to this little church for the past 30 years. It wasn't a perfect church, but it was a community of people who really believed in the Great Commission. And because of their obedience, many lives, including mine, were changed. My salvation story will always be tied to the legacy of this little church. Why I'm so passionate about not only personal evangelism, but but corporate evangelism is because I've seen the effects in my life. And as I was there for that last service, it made me think about our church. Are we like this church? And I want to ask you, what kind of church is cross-like? And as you look ahead, what kind of church will you be? What will you be known for? What stories will you hear because of the faithfulness of your church? 
And I'm thankful that there are stories of God's grace and how he has brought some to faith in Christ and how he has worked in people's lives through this church. But I pray there will continue to be more stories of how God has used you individually and you corporately as a church as you seek out to live the Great Commission in both your individual lives and in the life of this church. I want to encourage you to take small steps, to have realistic goals in being more faithful in this area. Pray for the unsaved in your life. Be part of evangelism training. Help with campus EV. Go on missions. Be part of mercy ministry. Have a renewed commitment to and the joy in sharing the gospel with the lost amongst you personally with people you work with and classmates that you go to school with, unsaved family and friends, and even as a church to those who come through your doors and who are in your midst who have yet to know Christ as Savior and Lord. Cross life, let us live on mission as those who have been sent out by our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together to look to your word, and we pray expectantly that Christ, that cross life would do great things for the kingdom. Would you use these faithful saints here as your vessels to win souls for Christ, whether in small or in great ways? Would you renew our commitment to and joy in the great privilege of sharing the good news of Christ with the lost and dying world around us. Have us be faithful to this task. By your grace and to your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.